let's move on. Uh, Bruce Abbey, I've asked to come and talk. Um, Long-time colleague, professor, obviously professor of architecture here, <clears throat> former dean from 1990 to 2002, educated at Cornell, graduated in 66, a year earlier than me, went on to Princeton in 71, um, followed by three years in the Peace Corps, which was uh, in Tunisia, a great experience, 66 to 69. He worked in the offices of Dan Kiley, who was, uh, I think, one of the preeminent landscape architects in America. Um, Michael Graves, Gettysburg Falls in Cunningham, before starting his own practice. Um, University of Virginia, where he was the chair and associate dean before coming to Syracuse, registered architect, GSA peer professional. And I asked him because he was the successor. He's the one that comes in when Werner leaves, and his view of the state of the school at that point is particularly critical. And so he's labeled his talk 1990 and beyond. Bruce Abbey. Well, second acts are hard to follow, and you can imagine having been a student of Werner's coming into being his boss, and I think we've heard, already heard that dilemma before. Uh, it was an interesting dynamic. But let me go back very quickly to position something, and I'll, I'll be very brief. I've only got about three pages to read here, so it won't take too long. Um, obviously, I was the beneficiary of the diaspora re coming back together at Cornell. I started in 61. Uh, Colin arrived in 62. I took Renaissance history and Baroque history from him. Warner arrived in 62, but I'd already had gone through first year, so Bruce Coleman got the effect of Werner's imposition onto the first year curriculum. But it turned out that the guys who had reassembled stayed with my class for three years after that. From third year, fourth year, and fifth year, uh, the same group of faculty stayed with my graduating class, which had a profound effect on one's education. And clearly, there was a classic moment in fifth year when there was a review going on, and a couple of us were standing in the back behind the critics, and there was a project on the wall, and just about they were starting to give the criticism, and we turned to each other and said, we know exactly what they're going to say. And it was sort of this Zen moment. It was time to leave <laughs> because we knew exactly what was, you know, the, the, the whole thing had been so inculcated in, uh, in our brains. I didn't see Werner for five or six years until one day I was sitting in the office at Michael Graves and uh, Werner and Lee Hodgson showed up and were surprised to see me sitting there at the table drawing away. And I took them on a tour of the renovation that was going on at 14 Nassau Street. And they were slightly astonished because here was an architecture that was in principle still espousing modernism and the proper context and syntax, but there was color and there was all kinds of detailing that was very different than anything that had gone on. It was very painterly. It was also symbolic and loaded with allusions and intentionalities. Um, and this was quite exciting. Then again, I didn't see Warner for a few years because then I started in 1974 uh, at the University of Virginia. But before I do that, and that's the piece I want to read, I, I want to give you five or six quotes from various people who you hear over the time that you're a student. And these things stick in your head and they become the basis by which you begin to think you're going to operate in the world. Um, the first quote is, to create a school, you need at least three faculty who are in sync and bright students. That's Lee Hodgson. Remember him saying that. Control first year in the thesis process, and you can create a focused program. Either that was Werner or it was John Haydick. I'm not sure. The basis of a sound pedagogy is to teach the lesson of the day. If the results are not satisfactory, then do it again. Rewrite the problem and see if you can get the point across and that everyone learns it. Really important. I'm talking about pedagogy now. Um, create certainty and then induce doubt. That's Colin. So you start off with a rigorous condition of fundamentals, and then you start to mess with their brains. Uh, T. 
teaching is an honorable profession. That is my quote, but it's what Werner instilled in me as a value system because of, of the way he was and the way he operated in the world. So he made, and that was not, it made teaching as a possible career as opposed to necessarily being a corporate architect. Um, and that is the one from John Shaw that I love the best because John came over my board one day and he looks down and he says, uh, Abby, you might could, should, would shave that drawing. <laughs> and, you know, it was one of those drawings that, that had a little too much greenery on it and obscuring the architecture. And it was about the best message I could get about and forever stuck with me that graphics have to be explanatory and clear. And good drawings, there's no excuse for not doing good, clear drawings. Uh, and John, I forever owe that one. But as you can see from the cast of characters that I'm quoting, it was that crowd that Bruce introduced here at the beginning of the, of the th lecture. And so I'm a product of that condition. I also was lucky enough when I went on to, to Princeton to study with Vidler and Frampton and a whole host of other people, Maldonado and so forth. Uh, so I had, I had the full treatment, as he, he might say. So off I went to Virginia, and that's where I will start this very shortly. And um, while at Virginia, I pursued a kind of parallel career to what Werner was doing here in, starting in 76, which I helped start the Venice program, the Vicenza program. I became chair. Um, brought, I hired faculty from here to teach there. Uh, he took students from here to come to Syracuse in the graduate program. Uh, and we started meeting on, on a wholly different basis at ACSA meetings and so forth and got to know each other. So by 1989, Werner announced that he was stepping down after 14 years as dean. He reasoned, at least in conversations with me, that there was a new provost coming in, or already in place and he was thinking that tough times might be coming and they had the opportunity to teach at the Etahan Zurich. And with, with old friends and colleagues that he really wanted to be back with. It and it was time. He was tired. 16 years, 14 years as dean is a long haul. Uh, it's one thing to push it up, the, push the whole thing up the hill once or twice, but when you do it 16, 14, 16 times, it's a long, long road. Um, I had crossed paths with him at past, I had crossed paths with him at ACSA events and been on occasion invited to Minnowbrook conferences and super jury events at Syracuse. So I knew many of the faculty here and the values of the school with which I was very sympathetic. The emphasis was on teaching architecture and preparing students for the profession, which after my 16 years in a 4 plus 2 program was refreshing. I love 4 plus 2 programs, but the, the idea of the opportunity to come back and work with a school that wanted to prepare people for the profession and teach architecture as to everyone as they could uh, really seemed to be a, a, a desirable condition. And it didn't hurt that we, Syracuse had already put in place, as you've heard from Randall, a Florence program where I could capitalize on my Italian learned while I was an exchange student in, in Rome uh, in the Liceo Classico during my senior year in high school. So I took the job when it was offered. I came up for interviews and all that stuff knowing full well that following Seligman was going to be a tough act. Little did I know. Um, upon arri arrival in June, Werner briefed me for three or four days, morning and afternoon and over lunch, on what he wanted to see happen next. <laughs> I should have saved the notes. I don't know whether they, they're in the file somewhere or not, but he had a list of things. You will do this, you will do that. I mean, this is like total control. Um, I did agree with much, but certainly not all of the suggestions, if you would, quote unquote. Uh, it was a bit, it was a long list and it was a bit overpowering and, and I have to say a bit annoying, uh, to be all honest, because I was coming in with my own agenda as well. Events, however, soon overtook all of this. In August, the university administration, including the five newly hired deans, went to Minnowbrook for a retreat where the chancellor announced that he was resigning that the university was in a severe financial crisis due to a 20% decline in the cohort of 18-year-olds in the United States, and that the new deans had to save the bacon, so to speak. Being a tuition-driven university budget, the target was set at a 20% cut reduction across the board, matching the demographic drop. Each school had to prepare a report on how this was to be accomplished and why they could or could not do it. 
Nice, nice beginning. Bait and switch. Here we um, And so I had the list from where what I had to do, and I had, you know, then I had the chance to say, you can't do anything. Um, you're in trouble. So, but I was successful in writing the report and defending the school, given that the, the School of Architecture had the highest SAT scores of incoming students, and we had the highest um, percentage of acceptance, or highest application rate for acceptances of any institution in the school. Um, and along with Maxwell and Newhouse, the School of Architecture was exempted from the budget cuts. Now, this was small beer to the faculty. We were hoping for great new progress, but it was a big beer to me because we didn't have to try to cut 20% out of the school, which would not have worked at all. Um, a voluntary retirement plan for faculty was put into effect, and university budgets were slashed. Ultimately, we cut out over $68 million out of the university budget, out of the operating budget, which is 1990, 68 million. So it was a lot of money. Uh, the engineering school, for example, was running a $10 million deficit, and they didn't know it. That's how sloppy things were. Um, and I won't go on about the administration and how this place ran, but that was just tip of the iceberg. There was to be no money for anything. Although eventually, as part of my hiring, I was given $100,000 to spend, and I got another $100,000 in a couple of years for salary improvement from, from the provost, which was a, a help at any rate. But so much for grand plans and aspirations of the new deans. I had, all of the, I had the pleasure of explaining all of this to the faculty at our first faculty retreat at Meadowbrook, and that was a rough beginning. That was a tough time. Nevertheless, it was a fascinating time to be dean during this period if you liked crisis management. And it forced the university to, to actually do a lot of things and discuss a lot of things that normally don't happen at the dean's level. And we actually cooperated with each other. And it was, it, it, it was a, a collegial effort to, to survive. Uh, and it, over time, the university came out of that process whole, which was a good thing. And I'm glad. I actually take great pleasure in having participated in that whole process, despite the angst that it caused. But I had to focus on the school and Werner's agenda and my own. And while not a complete list by any means, these are some of the areas that needed attention. And I'm just going to read the list, and I'll explain a couple of them, but not all of them, because it'll go on too long. But I think you'd be interested in, I think, to understand. It's not always about pedagogy when you're dean, and Werner knew this full well. Um, we had to develop new relationships with the alumni. They had, there had not been, there had been some contact with some of the alumni, but not a lot. The university had, had no in, uh, grant giving in place uh, development program. And it just was starting up because they, knew they were broke and they needed to try to figure out how to raise money. And for some odd reason, Syracuse had never taken raising money as a serious object, objective. We had some curriculum structure issues, which were difficult. Um, Technology courses were on top of each other. There were four credit hours each. They were occurring in odd moments. Um, students couldn't get through the sequence easily. We had a, Werner had a 50% attrition rate of first year students. Um, we were, got it, I think it was about 70, we lost about 25% when I started out as dean, and, but the university was really on our case. These, every one of these bodies was important to the agenda of the school, and we couldn't afford to do that anymore. Um, so we had to change the attrition rate, which meant we had to teach more effectively and, more, and, and work harder at our admissions side of things to get students who could do the work. I wanted to start a community design center, which David Gamble initiated and Liz Campbell took over. It obviously had its roots in programs that were earlier here in the, in the, in the school and with Doc Sargent, but we needed some way to re-engage the school in the community, and this was a, a good start later did become uh, upstate or ver versions thereof. We had to renovate Slocum Hall. We needed space. We were down to 45 square feet per student. Uh, we were on top of each other. Um, I got the data from Alan Chimikoff, who had just designed the School of Architecture for um, Arizona. And he, he was aiming for a goal of about 115 to 130 square feet per student. We wrote, I wrote the report to the uh, provost, and it was the first time he'd gotten a proposal for a new school on his desk. This was at the height of the recession. He kind of looked at me, are you out of your mind? Um, 
but it became the model. The report was well enough done and, and helped with the faculty, and Mullen particularly, uh, in f positioning the idea that the school could be expanded, could get new facilities. And the issue was whether we got a new building or whether you stayed in Slocum. Werner, when I told him all of this, that it was going forward, he said, stay in Slocum. He really, you know, and this was something he really wanted to see happen. And it took 12 years, three deans, four provosts, five chancellors, whatever. It took forever, but here we are. And only, the only problem is that we designed it for 550 students, and we now have 750 students. So we're back to 45 square feet per student again. Uh, so the, world, the, tur the worm turns. Uh, we had to hire new faculty. The voluntary resignation program made it available, made a lot of new positions available because the senior faculty retired. Some had to retire because they were 70, because that was the law. Lou Scholar got caught in that one. Um, the law was changed the next year, but the Pepper Amendment. But um, we had a lot of vacancies, and that created an opportunity to, to bring in a, a wholly different um, newer and younger and, and diverse faculty at that point. Um, we got an opportunity to hire new staff. And the best things that happened during this period was first was hiring of Chuck Savage, who was shared with uh, the uh, College of Human Development, which shared this building. And we got Andy Malloy, and then we hired Connie Caldwell to do the, the, uh, the uh, placement office. And all three of these people have been superb appointments for this school over the, over the years. Um, I had to raise endowment money, but the, frankly, the provost said, don't worry about it. You can't do it. There's no Architects don't make any money. You're not going to find any. Do your best, but don't waste a lot of time on it. Get the school working. Um, raise salaries. And we were able to readjust and get some money from the provost for that. Recruit students. And that was a lot of, a lot of time was on the road spending talking to students, trying to get them to come to Syracuse and, and and explaining what the school was about. Maintain the lecture series, exhibition series, visiting critic series. Uh, that involved you know, immense amount of time and my Rolodex and lots of other people's Rolodex. Um, develop a newsletter for the school. We, our own internal PR, other than the posters, which were incredibly beautiful and effective, either the lecture posters or the, the posters you saw that Randall showed for Florence and others. Um, we didn't really have any f formal way of communicating the school. And these are all on Werner's list, by the way. These are not just merely my desires, but they had to be done. Um, they would have been done whether they were on his list or mine. Um, and finally, and, and I think was interesting to be able to do, was to develop a, a really cordial working relationship between the, with and among the faculty so that we could keep and even in this tough period of economic restraint, uh, keep the school focused and develop uh, the programs that were in place. The central f issue facing the school, other than the lack of resources and the lack of space, was the breadth of the curriculum. We were known for teaching basic design really well. This is a quote from Philip Johnson, no less. Um, our thesis process was second to none, and I still maintain that it was a superb construct. But the pedagogy, seemed to me to be a bit narrow, and it was to Werner as well. It was really based on a Baukunst model, based on the intersection of constructional logic and modernist aesthetic. And the school needed a greater intellectual depth and breadth. Curriculum reform with more elective liberal arts courses was required, and we, we started, we restructured the curriculum so there would be elective, uh, liberal arts elective required every semester in the 10 semesters, once each semester, as opposed to lumping them together. And, that, and the NAB was also pushing in terms of their ratios. To do this, we had to raise the curriculum credit hour. We got up to about 168 hours to graduate, which was a humongous load. Um, and it meant 18 hours semesters every semester for five years, which is backbreaking. And ultimately, I kept toying with the idea of joining VPA and getting them involved with the school. Gershon said, the provost said, don't mess with that. Um, we tried thinking about alternative programs, um, four plus, you know, get a four year and out program. Cornell had a way to sneak out of the five year program, if I remember correctly. Um, the, uh, there were a number of agendas. I toyed with the idea of giving a B arch after four years and an M arc one after five. No one bought that one. Uh, but we had the credit hours, and we actually had the course content to do that. Um, 
And we were able to sort out some of the sequencing of events uh, and bringing in new faculty through new hires with different backgrounds. And Chris, Kristen reminded me that after I hired her, that Werner took her to lunch and grilled her for a couple hours to make sure she was the right sort of historian to be teaching here. So there was still the, the, hand, the heavy hand was out there in the back somewhere. Um, but that was fine. Uh, and I'm almost to the end. After three years, Werner returned to Syracuse from his time in, in Zurich. And I had gone over for reviews, and Art and I had gone over another time. And it was, it was a hard time for him. Um, he wasn't fully in control of the school, and he was a good colleague. And we, stayed, we were good friends and, and, and had immense respect for each other and what the job was about. But it was really frustrating for him. And uh, he, he would come visit me every Thursday afternoon and tell me what was wrong and what I needed to do. <laughs> you know, that got a little heavy-handed, too. But I didn't mind in, in, in the effect, because it was always meant with the best interests of everybody at heart. Uh, it was still about how to make a school really a good school. Uh, it was about teaching. It was about uh, the mechanics of putting and keeping together an organization that, that um, was operating at the top of its, as best as it could possibly be with the circumstances. Um, he returned to Florence after a couple of years here. and. And it was an appropriate time for him because he had a lot. Of, he was able to do projects there with students that he really enjoyed. It was the program he'd set up, and, and he felt really, he really was at home there. And the sad part was that that was where the onset of the symptoms that he forced his return ultimately. Between us, we had a 26-year run, and the school was really matured. I think during the the 1990s, um, we produced some wonderfully talented graduates who have gone on to successful practices. And it was a program that attempted to educate everyone to the best of their abilities. One of the parts of that was that we had, when I got here, we still had a tradition of flunking people in thesis just before graduation and their parents were in the outside hall. Um, there was a bad moment, for the dean particularly, because I had to usually make the announcement. Um, because of the way the educational model was working and the quality of the students improved, we were able to, I think, get the whole level of grading for thesis without inflation up to most, most people were at least getting a C, and if not, the, the average grade on thesis was a B by the, by the end of that period. And, but the process hadn't really changed. It's just that the education model had worked better and better to, to achieve that. Um, And finally, I woke up Christmas morning in 2001, looked out the window, saw the snow, and said, I've had it. So I wrote the chancellor and resigned <laughs> and flew to Italy, uh, <laughs> which was not the way I should have done it, but it was time. I'd been dean for 12 years and pushing it up the hill one more time. I had a new, I had a new provost, um, and a new chancellor was on the on the way in as well. Um, the nice thing was that just at that moment, Design Intelligence Magazine was starting, I guess it's about its third year issue, and Syracuse is recognized as being the, the fourth most useful, best, whatever, program in architecture after um, Cornell, <laughs> Harvard, Cincinnati, and then us. And that was based, at that point, they were doing mostly the surveying on the basis of professionals. So we were obviously meeting, and it was a good moment to, to finish up. But I might add, a year later, which I really loved, um, Art had stepped in as interim dean. And about six months later, Design Intelligence Magazine came out. And Syracuse was ranked number one in the East, ahead of Cornell, for the only time that I ever have seen that happen. And I think it was in a fitting and a fitting testament to what the program had been about and closure to what Werner had created and what he wanted to achieve. And I will stop there. Thanks. Our concluding speaker, um, Val, Val Ward.
an associate professor at uh, Cornell in, this, in the Department of Architecture, where he's been a department chair, a director of graduate studies, the coordinator of the first year Bachelor of Architecture program. In addition to architecture, he's also a member of the graduate field of fabric science and apparel design at Cornell. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Uh, previously, he was an assistant professor at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. He's authored numerous articles and essays on architectural design, criticism, and theory. Uh, things that have appeared in journals such as Assemblage, A plus U, Cornell Journal of Architecture, and the Harvard Design Magazine, as well as many monographs. He's collaborated with Tom Main in uh, writing the book Morphosis and with uh, Andreas Image in writing the book The Language of Architecture, which is about to be released. Uh, recently, research has focused on genre theory, including issues of fashion, formalism, populism, reception, and various associations to literal theory and criticism. It's a great sentence. Especially as related to the work of Michael Bakhtin, and as a partner in Simich and Work, um, he's collaborated on the design of numerous projects and competitions from the scale of the house to that of the city, and received his BRH from Cornell and his MRH from uh, Harvard. And I've specifically asked Val because, A, I've known him for many, many years. Um, and he's someone who hasn't taught here. Um, but we worked together in, um, in Seligman's office in Cortland. And as I recall, when he was endlessly confronted with the seemingly endless process of revisions and revisions and corrections, and I think we were working on the Olean file station. Yep, Andrea joined us for a while. As I recall, he described the process as, quote, the never-ending inward spiral. And I always <laughs> remember this incredibly visual image of it's never going to stop. Um, but he knows us very well. He writes beautifully about architecture. And because he represents what I have come to think of as the view of us from the outside. And so my pleasure, Val. Do we have things? Do we have things to see? Yeah, it's uh... OK. Let's see if we can find the right one. Do we know which one it is? That guy. Okay. How do we figure out how to do this? This is PDFs, right? No, this is a PowerPoint. Oh, it's PowerPoint. Okay, right, right, right. I should know that. Okay. So I'm going to try to read some of these things because I tend to digress a lot. You can see it already. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Um, yeah, I, I started, uh, actually my education, I suppose, with Werner started with in around 1970 or so. Uh, my, uh, I, I had an interest in architecture, and my mother knew Jeannie Seligman from high school. And she said, well, if you're serious about architecture, you should get a summer job working in an architect's office. And that uh, this friend of hers uh, was married to some architect, um, and all I knew was that he did this synagogue in Cortland where none of the windows on the outside lined up. Uh, and so I wasn't really quite sure that that's where I wanted to go, but that's, that's what I ended up doing. Um, and it was a very important education. And that's why, you know, I've, I've decided, too, that I, I, it's necessary for me to point out that how much of my education was also uh, Bruce, because uh, he was essential. I think, especially for a, a you know an eleventh grader who had to have every Friday off so I could work in my grandmother's fish market and Tuesday afternoon so I could take my my piano lessons, um, and so I think Bruce was able to more than anybody connect with this kind of fishmonger pianist that I had been. Um, so anyway, let let me let me just start, and I'm going to be a bit pedantic here at this in the beginning here because, first of all, you know, it's a, the outcome of this liberal arts thing that we're supposed to do because I spent most of my time doing comp lit. And I, just, I was starting to do a graduate program in comp lit until my father said that, well, let's write down the starting salaries of people who graduate in comp lit and th those in architecture. So I thought, okay. Uh, oh, and I had to pay for graduate education myself. So I didn't, I didn't finish. I was working on some, a, a, a thesis that had to do with with the murder tableau in, in Rossiasinative literature. Uh, scenes of the crime, you know, in detective novels. Um, anyway, this, for some reason, this at the time, well, maybe for me and uh, for a long period of time, this was how I understood architecture to be. Um, I understood this painting as everything. You know, everybody else typically likes the School of Athens, 
But I always saw that as like one of those yearbook pictures of the, you know, like the chess club or something. This, to me, was the, the sort of messiness and total, uh, I guess, chaos that architecture and architectural education always was. You know, you have this sky with this cloud that seems perfectly framed in the middle. You have this guy who's praying in the middle. You have all this strange activity on the right. You've got this big white horse, somebody on it, and these, these two guys there who seem to be not touching the ground at all. I think in here, right? Um, they're seeing a, a funny shadow. And, and you've got all these people over here who are pointing, so they know exactly what this painting's about, right? The essential uh, aspect of this. And then you have this guy coming in on the left who's sitting in this uh, litter. Um, so there's, I, there's this thing that, um, that Daniel uh, Chandler wrote about in Notes on the Gaze that has to do essentially with film theory and, uh, and theater. Uh, but I thought it was r really, really relevant to how finally, through Werner and Bruce, indirectly I understood, I understood this painting. I mean, there's this notion of the spectator's gaze, which is what you see when you first go into the uh, Stanzo de Irigador. You sta stare there, and you see all of this other stuff uh, encrusting the entire room things all over the place. You see obliqueness and you see this, the painting like this. Then there's a second spectator's gaze, which is where you sort of look up and you sort of imagine yourself floating up in the air looking at this thing. And then there's this third spectator's gaze where you start zooming into the painting itself. And you sort of, even though it's not possible, you imagine yourself to be literally hovering in the dome of this uh, space. Uh, in the cross vault, looking across at this thing, and you focus only on the painting and all the other things around to go away. Then there's this thing that was called the editorial gaze, which is the one that the person who produced it wants you to have based upon the cues of production. In this case, horizon line, vanishing point, all these kind of funny things that have to do with the columns and all this stuff. And clearly, the editorial gaze has to do with well, it has to do with this, this uh, a center somewhere in, around in here, a horizon that's going right through here, right through these guys' eyes, uh, and across this thing. And then there was this notion of the camera's gaze, the idea that you might sort of focus in on a part of the painting and look at that because it, that's the way, or that, that, that the art history text does it. It's like, well, you'll see camera gazes. Um, uh, and so there's this camera gaze, and then there's this notion of the... Uh, well, that's not completely there. But this is, there's the intradiegetic gaze, uh, intradiegetic get gesture, which is that these ladies here and stuff, they're pointing, right? In other words, they're telling you what's important. Look over there. And you get that in architectural history and theory a lot. That's what's important. Look over there. And, that's, and then there's this intradiegetic gaze, which is what uh, Pope, this is Pope Julius II, uh, is doing there at the top. He is sort of very calmly sitting in his gestatorial uh, chair, uh, staring back at uh, the guy who's praying in the, at the rear of the painting. And then there is the extra diegetic gaze, which is really crucial. This kind of, despite all of the chaos that's going on in this thing, there's this one, uh, two guys actually, uh, Raphael on the right, and, and then here, uh, Marcantonio Raimondi, who is Raphael's favorite engraver, who's staring right at us. He is looking at me and saying, this is, you know, in a very calm way, just pay attention to me. Come into the painting, uh, and we, you'll find your way around. And, you know, I found that the intradiegetic gaze up there was Werner, um, and that Pope Julius II, this notion of clearly within, clearly knowing, I mean, it, you know, the Pope shouldn't have been there in the Old Testament. Uh, and so, but he... <laughs> But he knew perfectly well what was going on, and he knew that he knew that all this thing about Heliodorus being sent by the king of Syria to steal the gold from the temple from the widows and the orphans. That this was all sort of prefiguring the idea of Christ coming in eventually and, and casting out the money lenders. And so and he was seeing this all in one great historic sort of period entity. Uh, and then there was Bruce, who is the extra diegetic gaze, the one who was always pulling me into the, into the composition, getting me to understand what was going on despite all of the things that seemed to be going on in the office uh, and at all the time. Now, while the, the Pope Julius II, Werner do, didn't look like that, um, Bruce actually looked just like that, <laughs> um, especially in 1970, right? Long hair. Yeah. Very long hair. 
And um, so anyway, so I had, so in a sense, my, my education with, uh, of, with, with Werner began uh, at that point, as somebody who is brought into the office, you know, and I sort of, uh, he, he showed me how to do drawings. Um, and, and actually, Bruce showed me a lot. I was given a, a Graphos set, pen set, which had been used by Fred Coder, which me meant that all the nibs were worn uh, in the wrong direction uh, because he was left-handed, and I was right. Um, so, uh, but, uh, you know, I sort of didn't know any better, so I just kind of went along with it. The other thing that happened in part of this education was that um, Werner gave me these five books from his office. He said, I had to read these five books. It was like, I mean, this is other than working, this is, this is the first job I've ever had not for my family. So I thought, okay, I better do this. And these were tough. I mean, this Space, Time, and Architecture was a really tough book. Um, uh, Theory and Design, the First Machine Age. And I found, oh, wait a minute, these two books are almost saying opposite things. Uh, experiencing architecture, which was the most accessible of all of them, and it's one that's sliding off the edge. I guess this will happen all <laughs> the uh, uh, Towards a new architecture by Le Corbusier. And then this then, the outline of European architecture by Pevner, which is not at all following the same kind of historical sensibility that the one above was. But this was the one that Werner then, and I always remember this because I thought it was, I thought it was very kind of odd. He opened this immediately to this one page in this book, and he said, see this. This is the most perfect space anybody has ever designed. And it's like, OK. Um, and I think he was right. I mean, the, the, so what happened was that the, that was the beginning of the pedagogy. And then, um, and then eventually, we get on to um, later days. Um, the options, when I, I uh, Werner told me I had to apply to Cooper. It was the only school that was doing any good work in those days. Um, he was already pretty negative about the things that were going on at, at Cornell. Um, uh, my, the guidance counselor at high school told me to go to Pratt, because I think that guidance counselors are, are always told to tell people to go to Pratt. And <laughs> I went to New York, and I looked at, I looked at Pratt, and Pratt was in Brooklyn, and I uh, I didn't go past the, the uh, walls. And then, and then <laughs> Cooper, uh, rat, did you know it was in the Bowery? Did you? Did you? And you went there. And so anyway, I couldn't take that. I couldn't imagine living there. And because I was you know, a suburban kid from upstate New York. And so I went to Cornell, and I didn't tell him that I was applying to Cornell. <laughs> I think he found out, though, anyway. So I started my education at Cornell then. And the thing is that in those days, the, um, at the start, it seemed. And actually, it's, it's, it, I suppose 10 years earlier, it was even more the case. The, the, the options were very clear in terms of how to teach. Um, it was easier to be didactic in certain ways uh, because it was acceptable and, and even at times, I think, welcome uh, for professors of architecture to be dogmatic um, and with much more limited materials for representation and construction in those days. Uh, I think the anatomy, anatomy of a building was always much more fundamentally understood. Uh, still, Werner and Cornell try to avoid a kind of simplistic didacticism. Um, as a matter of fact, my first year there was coordinated, and we tend to do the first year as like a package often, you know, with one person. I don't know if it was like, but it's been there since, since practically I've been there. And it was John Shaw, who you've seen in some of these other images one of the original Texas Rangers, but he was trying to institute uh, Matthias Ungers, who had recently come as chair, uh, curriculum, which was um, based on a kind of a strange version of Team 10, but it was also Ungers' own concept of, of sort of tropes as the major technique for initiating a design process, metaphors, sometimes metonymy. But uh, you did, first semester was, you know, house as bridge, house as intersection, House as ground relief sculpture, which was kind of strange. Um, and then, and John Shaw, so we did that for, throughout the first year. And then the second semester, the, it was essentially shopping center as bridge, shopping center as, <laughs> as thing. And, um, so uh, then in the beginning of second year, I had Tom Canfield, who was one of the old guards, but one of the really <laughs> strong old guards, I think, you know, one of the best uh, and conceptual thinkers there, and really great teacher. Uh, the one that Richard Meyer, uh, preferred the most of anybody. 
Um, but then uh, second semester of second year, I had Werner. Um, there was like six groups of us because some of you might know how from every once in a while a university or a chair or a dean decides that they're going to increase enrollment uh, to get a lot more tuition money. So the enrollment, uh, first, they, instead of admitting 70-something uh, first year, we, they admitted 120 people into our first year. Um, so we had six groups of 20, um, and it was a, like a tough. And, it was, and remember, first year was, of course, John Shaw, one guy, one professor with six TAs. Uh, second year, then, we broke into these groups. We had individual groups. And, but Werner was quite upset by a couple of things. And I, and I actually found a, a memo, well, a response from uh, the, uh, one of the acting, uh, one of the sort of chair, uh, assistant chair types, um, responding to Werner's memo. Because Werner wanted a, a clear message for each semester. And that meant that you had to have a faculty in that semester that was capable of teaching it. Second, the semester I was in had, had partly that. I think there was, um, there was Fred Coder and I think um, oh, Roger Sherwood or Alan Chimikoff or somebody was in there. But then the others were Team 10 people who had been brought in by Ungers. So it was a kind of mishmash. Um, but this was the semester that I entered into. And that was, uh, and I think, since I was, uh, this, I was told that this was all about pedagogy, I have to bring in this, this one point here that, that um, when there was a symposium, a uh, kind of joint Cornell-Harvard symposium on the 1970s architecture, you know, school architecture in the 1970s, um, Raphael Moneo, and, um, which is actually the third Raphael here because I had the painting. There was, I was also hired to tutor Raphael Seligman in math uh, because, because uh, math is the one thing that I was really good at. Um, and Raphael Mineo, then the third Raphael, said at the symposium uh, that one of the most important moments of the 1970s, as far as he was concerned, an architect in Spain, an architect who was practicing and uh, working with the schools, was the publication of this, this book, um, which was happening in, in 1972, um, because it was, it had a it presented architecture, but had a clearly didactic capability. You could develop a pedagogy based on the various projects that are within here, except for one. And he went through the list of, you know, Eisenman, uh, Graves, Hayduck, and Meyer, each presented different strategies of architecture, clearly distinct, that were all, uh, you know, influenced education. And he said the greatest uh, sadness of of this book and of the 70s was that, that it was Gwathmi and not Seligman. Um, because he said that the most profound academic uh, system would have occurred if, if that had been Seligman there instead of, instead of Gwathmi. And I think, you know, he's, he's quite right. Um, so anyway, the context then of Cornell, getting back into that and to point out this notion of the, of the pedagogies. And so much has been said already, I'm not going to mentioned it too much. I'm not sure who the second guy is. Um, somebody here know? Really? He would have been gone by that, I think. I think it's uh, Hafner or something, Bernard Hafner, who is an Austrian Team 10 guy. Who was, I think he was teaching. They, these were mostly some of the, the second year people you can't see. This is Jerry Wells off the right. Matthias Ungers was chair. Uh, Fred Coder, uh, Werner there, uh, and that's what they think. And then that guy. Um, and, but this school itself was slightly bifurcated because you had an Unger's strain of uh, academic modernism and then you had the other guys, the, maybe the, the Texas Rangers sort of strain of, of, of how to teach. Um, but, and I've said this elsewhere, that uh, while graduate students had to pick, they had to make their decision, you're in this stu Rowe studio or you're in Unger's studio, undergrads sort of negotiated their way through the education, which I thought was a kind of very strong thing to do, a very enriched moment. And the things I also have to say, um, Virgin Seligman never, never somehow downplayed the importance of Ungers, even though they often disagreed. And this is sort of typical, because there was no doubt that Ungers was talented. Um, so what we did was, I should mention that, okay, and 
is that the studio teaching, uh, this was one of the sections, the, the lesson of the day thing was mentioned, and that was what Werner very much believed in. Now, the problem is in a, in a 14 semester, uh, 14 week, 13 week semester, uh, you only have so many days. So you can only have so many lessons, um, and it was a problem, and with the idea that we redo it all over again. So we started with a cube which was, of course, you've seen the, some of the cube exercises, the spatial transformation. And the way it, that the studio would operate typically was, like in this case, there would be a table and all the cubes would be out on the table. Werner would go around picking up, uh, looking at the cubes and things like that. And um, like he picked up one cube and he says, whose is this? Whose is this? Right, and of course, somebody would raise their hand. Well, actually, it's mine. And he said, this looks like it was made with beaver teeth. Um, I was really bad at, at models. Uh, but anyway, that's the way it kept going. But the thing that was amazing is that otherwise you're all sitting around the table and you're seeing all this work. Typically, then for each lesson of the day, and as I said, this is spatial transparency, and that went on for like two weeks of e every two days, brand new uh, cube, along with then eventually drawings of it. Um, you would have a, a kind of dominant theme. Uh, there was then the, a, a, pro a program that had to do with site organization. Um, manipulation of contours, which was an athletic complex, uh, which is based on the thing that in Syracuse, I, I don't know if that's still existing, um, but that had originally planned to have a sliding roof. Uh, something in urban, uh, a section urban, which is urban slot site, townhouse kind of thing or whatever, but it was always very vague what the function was. It was more important that the site was this complex slot. Then there's hillside section, and there was topographic section problems. And, um, and it went on. There were many, many spatial exercises and things that had to do with the developments of, of architectural space in all of its complexities and strategies. But there was also things that had to do with aggregation, techniques of aggregation, of putting things together, uh, whether it be transformative, whether it be somehow cumulative, and all these things. Uh, and then that led to something that had first it started with like a mat housing and eventually to a tower. We did the senior citizen housing in Olean as a... <laughs> <laughs> as a, as a uh, project. Um, and uh, of course, I did mine as a single tower that was like 30 stories tall because I always wanted to have a building that had red flashing lights on it. Uh, and then we got, went on until the final problem of the thing was theoretically something that brought everything in together. It was a community college in, in Olean. It was problem number 11 of the semester and was a four week problem. Um, and this is, I, I have mine, you can see. Um, uh, I, th I started out doing Carpenter Center, but it turned into the Milliners Building. Um, but, and it's somewhere I, I, along a, like a river or something, and then there's a road, and then there's this giant park across the street, and I just this huge thing. Um, but I was much better at drawing than I was at um, models. So actually, I didn't even do a model of this. Um, and you can, but you can see all the elaborate sections and the things. And the idea, at which we'll, uh, you might see later, this, this thing where the, the edge of the waterfront, of course, just goes up and becomes part of the fire stair even of the building and all those things. Um, this concise study of elevations, always with proportions, always with elaborate proportions, always with various kinds of organizational systems uh, and everything that would somehow put things together. So there was always an emphasis on the, on the uh, process of design, on the emphasis on graphics, the techniques of graphics, their conventions, the accuracy of things, the craft of graphics, uh, because graphics were really quite important, especially they had to be clear. You had to have, uh, well, essentially, as Werner made it very clear, graphics were the architect's primary mode of, of conveying information to any, anyone. Um, and then there was the, the importance of the modes of, of uh, the various graphic things. Each mode, each type of thing, a diagram, diagrams were important, uh, obviously, plans, sections, elevations, axonometrics. Each one of these modes had its own objectives, its own capabilities, its own limits and circumstances. Um, but I think the most important part of that thing, and the thing that I remember so much more, uh, well, in certain, in certain ways, was that... Uh, Werner believed that we didn't have a clear enough understanding of the context of architecture that we were somehow entering into. We had had the two-semester uh, history of architecture survey, which essentially starts with the classical world in those days. Um, I don't even think we looked at pyramids because 
you see them on cartoons and things. So, and then we started with the, you know, the classical stuff, and then we moved into all of the things that were, that, uh, you know, we, I think we made it to the Renaissance by mid-year, and then from then we did, uh, you know, one lecture on Wright, one on Le Corbusier, and then one that had to do with Mies and everybody else. Um, and, but Werner did these lectures that he was ostensibly for our group, but it was also his way of somehow, I think, uh, in a very sneaky way, getting all of the second year finally on the same page, no matter what group you were in. Because even though it was only, it was essentially, it was done for us, it was in a lecture hall that, uh, in, a, in a big lecture room that was always crowded. It had everybody from second year, most people from third year, and even uh, th four or five other faculty members would come to this thing and just sort of shout things out to the screen. Werner would do these lectures that would start at 7 o'clock so you could break for dinner briefly between the end of studio and, and the lecture. And they would go until 11 or 12. And there were, there were I think, eight of them. And uh, they were ostensibly framed in the idea that they were trying to show us how, where, where we were in relationship to modernism. So it was the Pope Julius thing again. Um, except, in a way, I mean, the things that he showed were, like, amazing. I don't, I hadn't seen these things before. I don't know what, you know, the, the Villa Karma, you know, this, the Grobe, and, the, and then you start seeing these things together, and you think, oh, oh, well, of course. So those lectures went on, and it was usually pretty amazing, these sorts of things that were always from uh, various phrase, going forwards, backwards, backwards further, forwards more, um, things that nobody essentially was showing. Luckily, we had an incredible slide uh, archive. Um, so, and these things were, seemed to be making sense. Um, and again, it's one of those pieces where you just look at stuff, and even if there might not be exactly the right historical arguments for the thing, um, they tended to be uh, they tended to make a lot of sense. So I mean this, and I guess this doesn't work bode well. I, maybe this is anti-American that that Franklin Wright might have had something to do with William Morris, um, but you know, and of course he had some, a lot to do with the Japanese and things according to him. Um, and we do these kinds of things. And there was that there was all this stuff that was happening as a kind of grand sort of jolly relativity. All of architecture was somehow um, associated with each other. Um, there was always this notion of this kind of synchronic characteristic of architecture, um, this profound belief in the interrelationships between architecture and the ways in which a culture's art and various arts depict space, and that much of architecture's attributes, material attributes and textural ones and light and shadow and uh, everything, is evolved and, and processional motion were evolved from these relationships. I mean, nothing has more motion, architectural promenade, than in the end, the expulsion of Heliodorus in certain ways. So what happens was that um, I found that you know it was that consistently Werner really believed in in showing rather than telling things. Um, and even though there was this sort of dogmatism that was somehow uh, uh, potentially there under the surface, but it was always a, a, a kind of casual business of, of as I say, showing. Um, now, for me, the thing that was really important, and, and, and later in putting all this together, was this quotation from his Topaz uh, uh, Medallion Acceptance Speech where he says that, as I look back on my education at Cornell, it was in the absence of any rigorous, uh, uh, and it's missing here, instruction, a very beneficial learning situation. In other words, the absence of the rigorous instruction was the beneficial learning situation. Um, since it forced us to carefully and penetratingly involve ourselves with, well, Mies, uh, Mies and Wright's work. Because earlier he says that that's who they studied, Mies and Wright. Um, he said then, uh, goes on, is it was also the time of John Intense's Art and Architecture magazine and the case study houses. Then, and this is where I see the big tell here, though of even greater interest for us was the magazine Spazio, edited by Luigi Moretti, and especially the famous article on architectural space. Um, and, you know, in looking back at all these things, at Spazio and things, it's amazing how uh, similar 
this was to the way that Werner was teaching, and also at the same time how, how outrageous it was. Uh, most architectural magazines at the time in the 1950s there would essentially present buildings, right, because that's their sponsorship, that's what their, their ob objective is. They would deal with materials and various kinds of architects, the promotion of specific buildings and typologies, or functional typologies. Um, with occasional commentaries, and, and it, as a matter of fact, you know the original sort of Lockhart, Texas thing that Rowe and uh, Rowe Frank, well, Colin Rowe Road and John Hadex are, did the pictures mostly. But the, that w appeared in the, the cover. Our uh, story was the typo typology of nuclear power plants. I mean, so those were the things that were going on in, in the 1950s. Um, Spazio, though, instead was dedicated to presenting contemporary architecture and. Uh, both built and unbuilt, in the context of contemporary developments in the fine arts, as well as with certain provocative essays suggesting that modern architecture was able to derive an intensity from the arts that it couldn't get by itself, and that buildings of both past masters and of unknown artisans all had a value, like Swiss chalets and things like that. Murray's essays throughout the magazine, and you can see this is one of them, where you have a uh, Gino Severini, you have a, a, one of Guarini's, this is a, on the top, uh, one of Guarini's uh, uh, stereotomic uh, analysis things. And you have here, uh, you know, the back of a finger, uh, figure by Angra, and over here uh, was a painting by George Brock. Oh, and the other thing you'd miss was a billiard ball, a cue ball. So all of these things were, put in this juxtaposition. And sometimes he doesn't even talk about them. He just leaves you to see these things. Um, so all of these things happen. He's, throughout the magazine, his essays always were this kind of active process of analysis. We, we read them not as necessarily finished works, but as if they were unconstrained ruminations. You know, Often brilliant, sometimes reckless. But for all of that, the reader could absorb what they wanted. Moretti uh, began his very first issue of the magazine, uh, and he edited as well as ri ri writing a lot of pieces in it, with a, an essay called Eclecticism and the Unity of Language, where he, he introduced his affinity for the Baroque, uh, which he later described as high and esoteric language. Um, and his skepticism, which I find also existing in Werner, regarding the notion that each age subjected to a unique expressiveness, in other words, the pervasive zeitgeist issue. He found modern expressionism uh, present in the brush strokes of Rubens in his essays. He found surrealism in the fabrics of the 15th century painting by Cosa, in the fabrics. Uh, eclecticism, according to Moretti, is a necessity in a complex multicultural world. It was the only valid approach as far as he was concerned. And his essay, the essays that were in there were sort of amazing. And it was like, as I said, those lectures that we had had from Werner, um, uh, it was in many times a point by juxtaposition. This is the end of his uh, essay on uh, an essay that has to do with the, uh, the inlaid stone in, uh, in uh, San Miniato. Uh, stone inlays in San Miniato uh, and, a, and a discussion of the discolored, uh, inclusion of discolored stonework in, uh, in uh, Duomo in Pisa. So that's the end of that article. And then the next one, without anything, has this. You know, Mondrian, it's an, it's an article in Mondrian. Now, and they, he just doesn't say it, right? Because the reader, you know, is, has their own di diegesis here in terms of making these kind of points. Um, and he did, various kinds of things that I thought were also really, he, tr he, was, he analyzed a whole series of squares in uh, Venice and, uh, and produced a technique of drawing and representing the colors so that he could, uh, he produced an argument that essentially the ones on, uh, on the north side tended to be darker in tone. And of course, I, he probably carefully selected the squares, but the, and then you see the north side there, and then the south side there would be, have these other kinds. Of, were, and then he produced this elaborate color chart that had to do with buildings facing north, buildings facing south in Venice. Um, and let's see. And then, of course, the thing that Werner said was especially interesting, which was Moretti's exper uh, uh, experiments in trying to analyze space. Um, space was so tangible to Moretti as it was for Werner that you could produce these things. And, and it was amazing because you can go to, uh, you know, over there, you, you go to Hadrian's Villa, you know, and you, and you find John Hayek buildings, right? You know, right? By just draw, representing these things. 
And you have all these uh, incredible, bro, you, this is, this, ah. I mean, this thing which would have looked like a, a, like a, 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 a su suprematist composition was a Baroque church. Um, whoops, that's not what I was supposed to do, but it worked. Okay. And then there these kinds of things. He would, he would talk, he would have an article on the darkness in Caravaggio and re related to the uh, fact that Caravaggio, when he was doing certain of these works, was in Rome. And this is what the sunlight and Rome at noontime is like on Baroque churches. And then, of course, you know, so what we're doing is we're doing essentially the death. This is that one that's next to the Trevi Fountain. So we're dealing with these same kind of concepts of, of how three dimensions are modeled. And then also in this, you know, the, here's a space uh, and, uh, you know, one of his spatial analyses. Here is a sort of a view through a tunnel the view, this kind of extra died, intra diegetic guy, I guess. The view that this guy is getting as he sees the light at the end of the tunnel, and he's and Moretti uh, makes the analysis of this to entering the plots of Farnese. This is what we're doing. This is the processional uh, strategy. And there's another thing that's missing there, which is a romantic painting. So. Um, he did all of these various kind of things. He, he always found these things always dealing with each other. And he specifically extols, as in this case, the virtues of Baroque sculpture for the tendency to, to encourage uh, a mobile viewer uh, that you can't stand still. Leading the eyes from one center to another, cascading from one perspective system to another, uh, always in, in these works composed in multiple focal points, there's a virtual architectural promenade in these paintings. And something that Werner constantly emphasized in his enthusiasm, I think, for multiple centers and, and multiple centers and their recentering. Um, and so, you know, and that's why I think, you know, we can find some of the projects that were presented in this, in this magazine, but that also sort of continue to exist in Florence, some of them, <laughs> like Michelucci's uh, apartment building with shops. You know, I think that there's a, a, quite a similarity uh, in these things, and that you get in Werner's fascination for things like the, uh, you know, regulating lines, uh, the idea of especially centers, and multiple centers, recentering and over and et cetera. I mean, you could go on and on and on with this thing. You get a very much this this looking at a still surface, a virtual architectural promenade. And that was one of the things that we were supposed to do, be doing. So then, essentially. Trying to wrap this up then. In, so in 1932, and it's been mentioned already, we had Hitchcock and Johnson's you know, international style. Um, it dominated both public opinion of what modernism was, shaping what the public saw as modernism, but that also it did it within the profession. It listed a series of tenets that are teachable, um, you know, things that, and that are exactly fixed. And it's, you know, like asymmetry is, is required. Um, and I think the idea, it was, uh, clearly, uh, Werner didn't subscribe to any of these concepts of modernism. Um, and it's, it's obvious that he wouldn't. I mean, um, he based on, uh, you know, he wouldn't accept something that was essentially based on a kind of propagandistic functionalism um, on dogmatic aesthetic criteria, as I say, like, like you know, asymmetries are required. And an insistency uh, on a purity of forms, I mean, obviously, he wouldn't have used a, a term like that. And an aggressive claim of international legitimacy, despite the fact that in the international style catalog, all, almost half the works, I think, were from Germany, um, which was the interest of, of one of the curators at the time. And that these were all supported by, they, that they were all presented in support of a kind of inevitable power of the mythic, the mythic zeitgeist. It presented concepts that would soon bode ill for the world at large. Um, and and you know that somehow the international style was easily teachable, it it which made it easier to deal with in schools and especially after in the 1950s, many schools, uh, and then after the Korean War, where there was all of a sudden a huge influx of of um, veterans also who were starting to enter architectural education. Um, so what happens was that we got these, and the schools though and the public seemed to be immune to some of these lessons. So. Michelucci, as I said, is one of the people I think is interested in what happens. And, he, and Michelucci, interestingly enough, is one of the people who was dissed by Venturi in the first edition of the Complexity Architecture, 
complexity and contradiction in architecture. Uh, he was one of the architects that he, sh he uh, that the Venturi originally described as being essentially, you know, egocentric, you know, of an expressionistic modernism with no cultural values or whatever. But then he apologized later at the Yale thing because he said he hadn't visited any of his buildings in, when he said that. But um, uh, but this, I mean, it, this is a kind of uh, one of my favorites. And I think that there's so many similarities that we can see in many of the buildings, Moretti especially, um, you know, the, all of these sort of Baroque modernists, I suppose, um, the, between that and some of the work, the thing that was going on in, in, in Werner's works and in his teaching, things that he was trying to convey. I mean, buildings that I wouldn't have known about unless I had seen them in these strange late night lectures. So, Anyway, what happens was that while uh, most of architecture, utopian pretensions have been systematically belied, right? And that was already by the case by the 60s. Uh, Werner was quite aware that architecture had failed miserably, I think, as an agent of the social sciences, especially as social sciences being applied. Um, and, that, uh, and, and we find that as in some of the characteristics of, I think, of, of the transformation of the curriculum here at the school. Um, and that, it, that also this dalliance with economics was not usually in the public interest, but really primarily the interest of investors, that he somehow optimistically noted that the role of the arts in a society, of the arts specifically, in a general sense of the arts in a society, um, those arts were, have consistently served publics various publics through kind of elucidation, provocation, evocation, um, sometimes comfort, sometimes discomfort, sometimes quietude, and sometimes even aggression. That the arts have done this, and they've continued to represent societies and, and serve these societies in these ways. Rita Seligman clearly wanted, I think, architecture to be empowered with the capabilities that he saw in the arts and in traditional uh, various kinds of buildings for, uh, throughout time amplified by the advantages of new technologies, the things that sciences could provide, um, and essentially, you know, to, in the end, to, I suspect, to show and to not tell everybody uh, as with, you know, in the same way that we get it with the rendered, the rendered gaze of, of uh, Julius II. Okay, did I go too far? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay. I can come unleashed. Well, the idea was that we would have a conversation here. We did. You want to do that? <laughs> let's try it and let's see um, what we have to say. I have no planned agenda. I have no 30 questions or even five to, to trigger it. But um, I think there's some interesting counterpoints that have taken place here that might be, might be worth noting. And if we run out of steam, we run out of steam. I have a suggestion. Two slides you had on. I thought it was the one slide that you had on. Yeah. Well, while we are sort of repositioning ourselves, um, there's probably lots of questions are there. Yeah. Uh, what was? The, what is the year in which Matthias Ungers arrives? I mean, he comes first he as a visiting critic. Yeah. I have, a, I have a photograph of Matthias Werner and me in downtown Ithaca as a visiting critic, which must be 1966. Yeah. Yeah. But then he comes as the head of the, of the program. And uh, let's see if we can find his image. Uh, I think we can use hand mics. Can we do that? Does that work right? Yeah. That's fine. Oh, let me see. Where am I?
the thing that triggered my imagination here was that shortly after, well, when I graduated, went back to Cleveland for two and a half years, and then came back in December of 69 to, to start my time in Werner's office. And very shortly after that, there was a big exhibit at Cornell of the work of the faculty. And so it was a kind of moment where Werner's office and Stephen Peterson and Alex Dimitrov and John Herdig and Klaus Herdig uh, who else? Um, Fred Coder. But there was also then Matthias Ungers. And I know that because I was the one that had to make the run to Syracuse Blue to get all of the Matthias Ungers stuff mounted and put on great big panels square. And it was at the Andrew Dixon White Museum, and I remember that it sort of, to me, represented Cornell in capital letters at its sort of zenith, because it was very shortly after that that the big purge occurred. And all of that sort of one guard was flushed out, if they didn't have tenure. Lee Hodgson was dumped, but then managed to come back, and Fred Coder left, and Mike Dennis left, and Klaus Hertig left, and was like, whoa, what happened? And then in come this other influx of people, and suddenly the school was, instead of sort of narrow and deep, <laughs> it was sort of much more broad, but also much more shallow in a way. But it represented a kind of major cusp, I thought. Anyway, uh, the floor is open for comments or for questions, either way, however you might want to handle it. There's a lot of people who know a lot about this who are sitting out there as well. Anybody want to ask a question and launch? Consequently, and he was bringing in grad students from Notre Dame who had a classical education as well. And the emphasis on looking at historical documents and using precedent in a more rigorous way, Roman or other, etc., basically was in the air. Um, it wasn't only happening in Cornell, it happened a lot of places, but um, I think he's the, the Colin sort of wrote about it in the most clear-headed way. We had Complexity and Contradiction in 1966 when it was published. And Colin's comments were that, well, he has an enlightened sensibility, but this will never amount to much, if I remember this right. And, you know, that was one of the few times where he put it wrong. <laughs> Something happened because of that book. Um, but the, the general atmosphere was that, uh, that somehow you could combine modern aesthetic with historical research and produce truly relevant buildings based on the 
sequence of um, and there was always this other fantasy about urbanism that you could produce if you use traditional city plans, you still with modern architecture you could produce a new city. You didn't destroy the traditional values of the city uh, or traditional construct of the city. But you you could actually change the architecture and still produce a pretty decent environment. But that didn't seem to take on. Uh, most modernists today destroy the city along with the Yeah, I think my postmodernism too was um, it made the it made the uh, references tangible in many ways, maybe more direct. Um, there's also it was coming at a time where where modernism itself was being blamed for, for an awful lot, right? and so there and there there I don't know it's, been, it's often been pointed out by before you know that that, that typically in times of crisis that uh, various uh, uh, styles, architecture in particular, have a tendency to return to language, right, to the sort of fundamental language of the production. And I think that that was happening there. At the same time, we were following as, you know, people who were, who we, uh, were believing all along, and we saw this kind of evolution of, of, of their pedagogy into these other strains. Um, certain things like the Nordic classicism phenomenon, which I thought, which I I still very much like, but the, that kind of thing made it very clear to see in uh, in like Westbury, you know, uh, the the manifestation already in a kind of romantic classicism. You could find things that were later in modernism, right? Because you could trace these things, you could trace these things back. And I have to say too that you know, it, 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 like I kind of what is this what called when you do uh, full exposure. The, the copy of Five Architects that I showed, our copy of Five Architects, is autographed by Michael Graves. I mean, now if that means anything. Uh, but, uh, you know, and he, so here was this person who, other than the Corbusier, had Michael Graves, I, I think was amazing because he produced at least five canonical works of architecture that illustrate five really key periods uh, of, of, of architectural production. And that, that was pretty, you know, pretty impressive. I mean, and, the, and um, I don't agree with him. I didn't like the Portland Village at all, for example, which was sort of a mess. But then there it was. And, you know, it was put out there with, as a polemic with all these other forms. I wonder whether the, the fact of the article uh, by Colin in the introduction of five architects where the agency in modernism, the modern project, and the ideology of the welfare state and so forth was finished. And now, so bad, and it's okay, and how much that encouraged Graves to be much more intellectually rigorous about it, so hence figurative architecture, not quite, well, homo, so, yeah. so a new group uh, for, for generating um, form, and, and because the, the project was over. Well, I think that Collins' article, I remember reading it many years ago, uh, is, and I didn't understand it as a said something that at least Graves about his work. Incidentally, the two, I asked Bruce to put this up. Uh, I think that the first, the top image uh, represents simultaneous experience of space, something that came from visual uh, evolutions and revolutions in the early part of the 20th century that interested Colin. Uh, the second one to Werner as 
Ludwig Lloyd Corbalto at one point. In other words, because, and because Paul and I think, you know, uh, uh, didn't care for uh, messy pedigrees in certain kinds of conditions, I think. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm, I mean, in other words, there was so much criticism, I'm sure, that happened casually. I know that happened casually. Um, at the same time, one of the things that's interesting is that, that you know, when it was um, Charles Moore, of all people, who was assigned to critique the uh, Westville housing project, yes, for sure, Werner was delighted. I mean, he didn't care who does it as long as it was somebody, and he loved it, it was somebody as smart yeah. as Charles Moore, even though already you knew that he was sort of walking into the swinging blade for that. Charlie Moore wrote a very positive article. Mm -hmm. He was really impressed. <laughs> he said so. But it was as much that it was able to have been accomplished at all.